the first Bay Forum discussion series of 2020. Uh, first, we'll start by thanking our sponsors, Rhode Island Sea Grant, provides our cookies out there, uh, as well as the GSO Dean's Office. So for those who haven't been here, I do see some new faces. Our format tonight is our usual. We're gonna have two speakers, each go for 20-ish minutes, or however long they feel like. Uh, and you are welcome to ask questions at any time as you have them. We want this to be interactive. We don't wanna lose anybody along the way. Um, so just get their attention if you have a question as they're going. And with that, I'll just hand it off to our first speaker, Maggie, who's gonna talk about Food Web of Narragansett Bay. Hi everyone, I'm Maggie Heineken. I am a second year master's student with Jeremy Colley here at GSO. And I'm gonna be talking about some of the ways to model food web in Narragansett Bay. Not an exhaustive list of how to model food webs, but just some of the stuff that I've been doing in my research. I don't think the clicker works. Oh. Sorry guys, but it needs to be on. Okay, a little bit about me. I grew up on a farm in Iowa. That was actually my view from my front porch. Um, involved in food production, but ours was pretty land-based compared to now working in fisheries, so ocean food production. Uh, I went to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, uh, where I did kind of a make-your-own major focusing on fisheries management and some environmental economics. Then I was a fisheries observer for a year and worked in the observer program office um, on Cape Cod for another three years after that. So spent a lot of time working with the ground fish fishery of New England. Um, worked at a Point Judith for a while um, as an observer on those boats. And then uh, in January of last year, started at GSO and get to do all the fun stuff in the fish labs, like help catch samples for Nina on cod fishing trips. So the outline of what I'm gonna talk to you today is kind of why study food webs. We're gonna go into some of the approaches of food web modeling. Uh, I'm gonna show you my research, which is an ecopath with ecosim model of Narragansett Bay and the food web of the bay, and then do a little bit of a deep dive into a striped sea robin diet study we did this summer with an undergrad. So to start with food webs. So this is kind of a typical food chain, um, the kind of most simplistic way. So you start with phytoplankton, some sort of primary producer, they photosynthesize, they get their energy from the sun, they're the base of the food web. And then they're eaten by something, in this case zooplankton, which is eaten by something, say a small fish. So a very linear trajectory. But it gets more complicated when you start realizing that there's a lot of different predators for any given species. They're not just eaten by one thing. And then it gets even more complicated when you actually look at an entire ecosystem. So this is one for water birds of the Chesapeake, I believe, that I got off Google, uh, to kind of illustrate uh, a, a basic sort of marine or estuary food web. So they're much more, food webs are much more accurate than the kind of linear food chain, which I started with. Uh, there's many connections between species and I'm gonna use the term trophic level a lot, so I'm gonna give that a little bit of a definition. So these right here along the side are the trophic levels, so primary producers, things that photosynthesize, plants, phytoplankton, they would be trophic level one, they're the kind of base. And then anything that eats a trophic level one is a trophic level two, so all of your basic herbivores, and up each time something's being eaten, you go up a trophic level. <coughs> So why study food webs? As we saw, species don't exist in isolation. There are two main pathways we kind of use food webs to analyze. First one being a bottom-up effect, which is kind of exactly how it sounds. Something changes in the bottom of the food web and you wanna see how that disperses through the rest of the ecosystem. So an example is something like tenophores, these little gelatinous zooplankton. If they have a bloom, they kind of graze everything else of the zooplankton out. Um, and we want to see how that change in lack of food at the bottom of the food web may affect our top predators. So that would be a bottom-up effect. But conversely, there's top-down effects. So this is our friend, the striped sea bass. Everyone likes to eat them, catch them. But what happens if we over-harvest or under-harvest or there's more or less? How does a change in a predator impact the groups below it through changes in predation? And that would be a top-down effect. But more generally, there's this kind of trend towards ecosystem-based management instead of a single species approach. So this, this is the definition from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration saying that ecosystem-based management is an integrated management approach that recognizes the full array of interactions within an ecosystem, including humans, rather than considering single species or issues or ecosystem services in isolation. So you can't really look at what's happening to the system as a whole unless you know how that system is connected to each other and how those species are connected, usually through a food web. So step one in creating our little food web is map out your system. 
This is an example of a George's, Bay, uh, George's Bank ecosystem from Wildermuth in 2018. So this is just a qualitative um, model, also called the network model, that is just kind of the map of the system for better conceptual understanding. So you can see what kind of groups you think are important and what groups may link to any other ones. So we in this one have some forage fish, we have habitat, we have the fisheries, we have temperature, and all of these things trying to see how they connect to each other but obviously it can get very complicated very quickly. But we have this map now and we want to actually do something with it. So we want to try to make predictions with a qualitative model. So to do this, I'm going to show you a little bit of how to read one of these models. The direction of the arrow matters. So we have the pointy side of the arrow and the, the circle side of the arrow. This indicates positive relationships, so things move in the same direction, a negative or inverse relationship. So here's our example with our friend the herring and the striped sea bass, a typical predator-prey uh, lake. The herring is the prey. If herring goes up, that's good for the striped bass. They like having more food. It's a positive interaction. So the bass gets the pointy side of the arrow. Conversely, if this, there's a lot more striped bass, that's not good for the herring because then they have more predation pressure on that population. The, the herring doesn't want to have more predators. They, that's a negative, and hence they have the circle side of the arrow. So here's a simple food web model. We have plankton, benthos, kind of first level of fish, and a second level of fish. So we want to use the, a network model like this in simple positive-negative interactions to try to understand how decreased plankton would affect the benthivore group. So we start with decreasing plankton, and then remember the positive side, the pointy side of the arrow, positive towards benthos, positive towards benthivores, a negative times a positive times a positive is a negative. So via this pathway, if you decrease plankton, you are likely going to get a decrease in benthivores because they have less food. But there's another pathway in this particular model. If you decrease plankton, positive arrow to planktivores, positive arrow to demersal piscivores, so piscivores are fish that eat other fish, and then a negative down here. So a negative times a negative times a positive is positive. So in this energy pathway, decreased plankton, you'd likely see increased benthivores because now their predators have decreased. So which pathway is stronger? This is kind of the limitation of qualitative models. They're really good for kind of understanding what links are in your system, but they can give you contradictory results like this. So the next step is add some numbers to it. This is usually the step where you have to go out and collect some data, do a more thorough literature review. Sometimes all these numbers don't exist, and the best you can do is a qualitative model, but ideally you want to get to a more quantitative model. So this is an example from the English Channel. It's looking at carbon fluxes. And when you do a quantitative model, there's kind of two big things you need. You need how much of something you have. So this would be mesozooplankton, and you have 95 metric tons, or some sort of amount of that group. And then you have a rate of change. Say how much carbon from mesozooplankton goes to microzooplankton or vice versa. So you have the amount of something and you have how much that changes. But given how complicated we see these models can be, it's much easier to use a computer software than try and do this all by hand. And that's where the software EcoPath with EcoSim comes into play, which is not the only software to use for this thing, but it's the one that I use in my research. The base of EcoPath with EcoSim is that it's a mouse balance model. So that means any energy into a particular group has to equal the energy out. You need four basic components of data. You need the biomass, how much there is. You need the consumption rate, how much they eat. Production, which would be how much they grow or use. And then the diet of where are they getting their energy. So this is kind of a schematic from the EcoPath software itself. So different types of production are um, you know, they can grow and their biomass accumulates, they can have um, migration into the system, the catch that fisheries take out is considered production, um, and then production has to equal consumption because it equals out, and consumption would be how much you grow, your metabolic costs, you know, just the cost of being alive, and any unassimilated food. And there's also a lot more capabilities of EcoPath, you can add lots of other types of different information to get a more sophisticated model, but we don't really use all of that. So now we're trying to put this into the bay. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the bay that this model could get very overwhelming very quickly. So the model we ended up making is this one. 
And I need to give credit where credit is due. Annie Inez Gold, who's not here, she's in Austin Humphreys lab on main campus, has been, she and I have worked together on this model for about a year now. Uh, couldn't have done it without her, so this is only you know, half my work and half Annie's. Um, so this is the 1994 to 1998 static snapshot of a food web in Narragansett Bay. It's kind of yearly average, and you can see we added everything into functional groups. So we grouped things that eat the same things together because otherwise you'd have, you know, a hundred different nodes and a thousand different lines connecting them and that, you know, wouldn't give us many usable results. So we grouped it like this to try to keep it simple. So we have trophic level along the top, so our primary producers are on the bottom, you get higher up. It shows the linkage to other groups, usually through predation, and the size or the, the thickness of the line would be the strength of that link and the size of the circle is the biomass. So we have more deposit feeding benthos, which would be our polychaete worms, your small uh, snails and things like that. We have more of those than we have piscivorous fish like fluke. And then the cool thing about EcoPath is that you can add a time dynamic component, which is called EcoCiv. So we use our 1994 model and we start to fit it to the, the data we have observed between 1994 and 2018. And so that's what these plots are, because we want to fit our model to the data we observe, because then we can use it for projections into the future. If it successfully captures the patterns that have happened, it's likely to be successful in capturing patterns that may happen in the future. But there's a lot of parameters to tune, and there's a lot of knobs to fiddle with to get this fit, and we haven't actually finished it yet. You can see our piscivorous fish, the line being the ecosim output, and the dots being uh, what was actually observed. Piscivorous fish is doing okay. Like we're capturing that variability. Benthivorous fish, less so. And clearly we have something going on with planktivorous fish because we're not really capturing the variability right now. So hopefully in uh, a while I can give an update and we'll have a usable model. But right now uh, we're just still in the fitting process. So I do want to devote some time to the work we did this summer, which is on the diet of striped sea robin. We had the help of an undergrad from Roger Williams University. Uh, to do work with this project and we're just kind of writing up the results now. So you might ask why striped sea robin? They're not a fish that people usually talk about in Narragansett Bay. No one's really fishing for them. No one's really eating them. Well to start with the model was this basis um, but I have actually eaten them I must say. They're pretty good in fish tacos. Uh, highly recommend keeping them if you catch them. But this model is called an MDS model and it basically is things that are closer together are in fact more similar. So this is the diets of the different fish that are in the model. And so you can see this nice circle around all of our things that eat plankton. You can see this nice circle around all of our fish that eat other fish. And then you have sea robin out here in left field. So this was with diet data from offshore from most of it from the 80s. Clearly this was not likely to represent what they were eating in Narragansett Bay, and we didn't even know which group to put them with for the model. So we needed this data. But besides that, they're really increasing in the bay. Back in the 60s and early, uh, late 60s and some in the 70s, you just weren't seeing them in the bay. And this is annual mean catch per tow and year, and we're just catching a lot more of them now than we used to. So there's more of them in the bay, but they're also staying longer. And this is some of Joe's work on residence time. So these fish don't spend their entire year in the bay. They are in here for the summer and for the warm temperatures and then they go offshore. But how much time they're spending in the bay has been increasing. So there's more of them, they're here longer and we really don't know what they eat while they're here. Hence we did this study. So we went out and we sampled some fish. We used the GSO uh, fish trawl, we used the state DEM fish trawl and our undergrad went rod and reel sampling as time allowed and if it was a nice day. But we had, oh, this picture got distorted, but we had our bucket of sea robins. We did some dissections that were going on. See what's in, we did, we recorded length, sex, um, some characteristics of the fish, what was in their stomach, and then counted and weighed all of the prey types that we found. So some of our results, we found 51 prey types. Granted, this does include unidentified fish, unidentified goo, but also some really interesting species that we weren't expecting, like a Solomaya clam, which is actually a clam that gets its energy from sulfur rather than filter feeding from the water. We didn't expect to see something like that in the stomach. So we had a lot of different prey types. We found that larger fish consumed more crabs, other large crustaceans, uh, such as mantis shrimp and fish, and smaller sea robins ate more shrimp. 
We saw that the diet varied throughout the sampling season and by location, and that's kind of what this is showing. So each one of these bars is a month, and each color is the proportion of a different diet group, a prey group that we found. So you can see in May, we had a lot of kind of other crustaceans. This was a lot of hermit crabs, a lot of crangon, which is a type of grass shrimp. And then as the time went on, we got a lot more crabs, a lot more of the fish that's in this yellow color. So they're clearly the diet was changing. So their role in the food web is then also changing depending on the time of year. Another thing of note, it was interesting that males were primarily captured earlier in the season and we caught more females later. So some of this change in diet might actually be a change of which fish were here at that time. A little more results. We found that larger fish ate at, larger, at higher trophic levels. So that's this graph right here. We have the total length of the sea robin. So smaller sea robin, bigger sea robin and their trophic level. Pink is female, blue is male. You can see our, our large fish, a lot of them were female and those tended to eat at higher trophic levels, more fish, more crabs. And while sea robin are not economically valuable, they're not a fish that people normally target, they were eating a lot of things that people do care about. So these are pictures of things we did find in sea robin stomachs. Granted, we didn't find a lot, and when we found them, they were the larval stage about this big, but they were in the stomach, so it means sea robin could be having an indirect impact on our fisheries here. And we think that some of this overlap between the larval stages of these commercially important fish like uh, winter flounder, summer flounder, black sea bass, we even found a cod early in the year, uh, that changing residence time of sea robin, so the fact that they're coming here a little earlier and they're staying later, is changing what prey they overlap with in the bay and kind of allowing them to access the, these new prey sources of baby fish that they might not have before. Further work is we're going to be looking at the effects of temperature on what they eat and how much they eat um, and the sea robin reproductive cycle if their spawning season changes what they eat. But this is just a little infograph of, so we have our lovely striped sea robin, this inner circle is stuff that we actually found in the stomachs, but you can see that they're only about one link away between the primary production of the bay, all of the different other species of ecological importance. They eat the prey of other things we do care about, and they sometimes eat the fish and invertebrates that we directly care about themselves for commercial or um, recreational purposes. So we think that sea robin might actually be playing, has the potential to have a lot of influence on what's happening in the food web of Narragansett Bay. So with that, I wanna thank everyone who's helped me on this project, again, especially Annie, um, and everyone else who's been really instrumental in all of this work and our funding through um, SEAM, which is the Coastal Ecology Assessment, Innovation, and Modeling Group. Um, and with that, I can take any questions. but they are a generally warm water fish. So their uh, center of biomass has historically been a lot more southern, and then as southern New England waters have been warming, their, the habitat available to them just based on temperature has expanded, and we think they're kind of taking advantage of that and just getting up into the bay more, because they are very common in like New Jersey bays, New York bays, um, and they've been a little bit more established there, and they're continuing to establish themselves here. Yeah. I actually don't know that much, but I do know they're not they're not a, a small like a fish that a lot of things would eat because they have a lot of spikes. So in let me find the, the real photo of the sea robin. So they have there it is. There's this is an armored plate, like good luck cutting through that. It's an, it's very, very thick skull. There are spikes all along the edge of it. There are spikes under these fins, and these really hurt when you accidentally grab a sea robin when you're not supposed to. So I think they have a lot of defenses, and I would imagine that when they're small, you know, everything can eat a, a baby fish. Um, but I don't think the adults are heavily controlled by predation, but I wouldn't be entirely confident in that answer. Yeah. Do you think there's a positive or negative effect on the bay? 
I think it's hard to sometimes say what is good or bad. I think they have the potential to change what's happening in the Bay. So um, sea ramens, it seems to me that they're just kind of little vacuums. Like they're gonna eat whatever fits in their mouth and their mouth really expands. So they're gonna like basically eat whatever's in front of them. I mean, we found fish that were about this big with mantis shrimp that were about this big curled up in their stomachs. So I think it would be bad for any, if the, and the sea robins can go into very shallow water. So if there's a shallow water spawner, like species that's spawning, such as like winter flounder, and the sea robin are in the bay overlapping with them when the, the spawning season is happening, I think that's very bad for whatever fish is now getting eaten. So I think winter flounder in particular is getting hammered by these guys. But we could do more work and we want to look work of if sea robin are selecting certain types of fish to eat or if they're literally eating whatever's in the bay in the proportions that they're found in nature. So we're trying to see if we have data to do that because we're not sure if they're seeking out to eat certain fish. Um, but I think they can eat a lot of fish and cover a lot of ground. And so I don't think they're good for other fish populations. Thank you. Do they yeah. eat their own? We, uh, yes, we found one striped sea robin in the stomach. It was a big one, had a very little one. Um, and we've seen more often, the striped sea robin have the northern sea robin, which is another species of sea robin, a little, um, a little smaller, more cold water species. So they can clearly eat other sea robins. Um, but we don't, we didn't see a lot of that, but it was on the same level of how, how many times we saw like cod or sea bass or something. Are there two species of sea robins in the bay? In the bay, yes, there's two. So there are more offshore, but in the bay, there's the striped sea robin, which is the kind of climate invader, as we call it. So it gets big, it vacuums everything up. Um, it's a warm water species. And before, there's a northern sea robin, which doesn't have these stripes right here. It's a little more dull colored. And they, the biggest ones I've seen of those are that big? Well, they get bigger than that, but oh. they don't get as big. They don't get as big. Um, and I actually don't know a ton about northern sea robin, but it's hard in a lot of the past literature of the bay, they're grouped together. So if you read some papers from the 70s, it's hard to know what impact is actually the striped sea robin versus the northern sea robin because they were just treated as sea robin. Yeah? How long would you say that they're in the bay around like, around, like this year? Like, like this year, April? Did they show up? Uh, yeah. We sampled from May to October, and we were getting baskets full of them. Um, Joe, you know how to read this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over 250 days a year, so, you know, about two-thirds of the year. I'd say they show up in, like, last week of April, early May, and then taper off somewhere around, like, between Halloween and Thanksgiving-ish, somewhere in there. Uh, could be a little later if it's a warm fall, like 2016, we had that super, super They're here a lot of the time. You know, when it's pleasant for you to be out on the water, the sea robins are probably also here. Did you sample a bunch of different locations? Yeah, so we tried to get a representative um, sample of some of the different, we basically split it up into lower bay, mid bay, and upper bay. So we, uh, we never got samples in Greenwich Bay or in the um, Providence River, but we used GSO primarily to get um, the West Passage here, we used DEM to get East Passage. Um, our undergrad actually lived up here, so he was able to do a lot of uh, sampling in Mount Hope Bay. But we kind of were limited to the resource. We never did directed trips for the Sea Ramen. It was kind of people who were out, we asked them to keep any they found. And so our sampling was kind of based off what other people were doing. I'm gonna let Joe tackle that question. Oh, that's my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I work on winter flounder, um, and we fit a life cycle model for winter flounder in the Arganthus Bay to try to understand, um, basically, if there's evidence that early in the life cycle, somewhere a bunch of them were dying, and that we kept ratcheting down harvest regulations, and they just wouldn't come back. It was you know something going on before they were fishable size. Um, and the life cycle model uh, spat out 
high summer temperature being a problem, low dissolved oxygen, so hypoxic conditions, cormorant abundance, those diving birds that everybody's really seen increased abundance, and really, really strongly said striped sea robins are a problem. Yeah. yeah, so most of the fish in these two months we found, a lot of them were winter flounder. Yes, and so like we see that residence time back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when winter flounder were abundant, striped sea robin didn't enter the bay until July-ish, when winter, the end of the year winter flounder were already pretty big to escape better. Now they're here when the winter flounder is just transitioning out of the vulnerable phase. Um, and research from New Jersey suggests that striped sea robin will even zero in on winter flounder when they're in high abundance in this kind of vacuum of, so, yeah. <laughs> Not good for winter flounder. Yeah. Are there related studies on uh, actual changes in the water temperatures and the impact in other communities? So there's, uh, Joe and uh, our advisor Jeremy have done a lot of work in Candisoviat about uh, correlating temperature changes because we do have a long-term temperature record in Narragansett Bay, so we really do have a, a pretty nice record of how the temperatures of the bay have been increasing on a almost weekly time scale, weekly, monthly, a good time scale. Um, and we have all the fish data from the GSO fish trawl. So f with varying goals, people have looked at temperature as a variable impacting fish populations and distribution. So Joe's work is a lot about this resonance time and not saying all like how much fish they are, but how long you see them is very tied to temperature. With the striped sea robin in particular, we do have temperatures around when we caught all of them and, the, and when we actually caught them and the kind of days around that. So we want to do further work looking to see if were sea robins generally eating more when they were higher temperature, you know, because they had a higher metabolic cost. Uh, did temperature play a role on what they were eating at the time? And we just haven't done that analysis yet, but it's something we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. What happened in 1985 when it kind of started leveling off? What did that do all those years? <laughs> So there's some research to suggest um, that when a species is moving into a new area, you start to see like sporadic bursts of them. And so you can kind of see in those points, right? Like the first four years are zeros, and then for a few years we caught them, and then zeros, and then a few years we caught them. And so the, the smoother there is just kind of picking up on the fact that it's going from zero to a lot. But in reality, it was kind of like some, none, some, none, some, none, here to stay. And then since they've kind of firmly established, it's a still increasing rate, but slower because obviously it's not from zero to 200 anymore. It's kind of a, a shallower slope. Um, and something to note about this is some sea robin, I mean, when reviewing the literature, it sounds like some sea robin will spawn in a bay or estuary and some won't. So you're probably never going to see sea robins there, like it'll never get to 365 because a lot of them do go offshore to spawn, so they're only going to be here for a certain amount of time anyway, but the litter, I need to dig more into that particular question. Okay. Well, I'm sure Maggie will stick around at the end. If you think of anything else, we'll thank her one more time. <laughs> switch over to our next speaker, Nina, to tell us all about cod and black sea bass in Rhode Island. So my name is Nina Santos, um, and today I'll be talking to you about competition between Atlantic cod and black sea bass. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to tell you a little, about, a little bit about who I am, and um, I'm originally from New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, this is a picture from New Bedford Harbor. Uh, New Bedford the, is a fishing port in Massachusetts, uh, one of the most important uh, fishing ports in the United States. Um, and a little bit more about me, my father was a scalloper, a lot of uh, my uncles were scallopers. This is actually um, the boat that my dad would scallop off of. Uh, so uh, fishing and 
uh, kind of the ocean have always played a pretty big role in my life and I, it's something I've thought about for a really long time. Uh, and so for my undergraduate degree, this is me in undergrad, I went to UMass Dartmouth and studied biology. Uh, and then I spent some time uh, in between uh, that and coming here to URI as a Commonwealth Corps member uh, where I was working with an organization called the Buzzards Bay Coalition, which is kind of like the organization you guys have here, uh, Save the Bay, which is working to protect clean water in Narragansett Bay. This is uh, our similar organization in Massachusetts. So uh, we work to protect clean water and uh, educate uh, children and families on how they could save the bay, why it was important to save the bay, and ways that they could enjoy Buzzards Bay, like teaching people how to clam. Um, and now I'm the URI fish trawl assistant, which Maggie mentioned previously. Um, and I'm also a member of the Ocean Eco Geochemistry Lab, working with Dr. Kelvin McMahon here at DSO, working for, towards my master's. Um, and I'm particularly interested in uh, researching about fisheries um, and food webs and how uh, climate and other anthropogenic impacts could affect those two things. Um, so like I said, I'm going to be talking to you about cod, specifically in southern New England. So um, the cod fishery has played a really important role in the ecosystem, economy, and history of New England. Um, this is a photograph from the uh, Massachusetts State House uh, where they have a cod carved out, carved out of wood uh, called the sacred cod. And um, this is kind of a quote that they have about the sacred cod. Uh, it's a memorial of the importance of the cod fishery to the welfare of this commonwealth, this commonwealth being the commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and additionally, since I'm from Cape Cod, and as many of you may, um, originally from Massachusetts, many of you may know that Cape Cod was named after uh, the abundance of cod that could be caught off of the shores of the Cape um, at the time. Um, and it has also been said that the first uh, European settlers to uh, New England, uh, some of their first exports back to Europe were from the cod fishery. So there's a really a lot of history uh, with the cod fishery here in New England. Um, unfortunately, uh, the cod population uh, had a huge uh, <coughs> decline and crash in the 1990s, um, and they are currently at historic lows. Um, that's due to uh, overfishing and other uh, environmental effects such as rapid ocean warming. Um, and it's also important because uh, southern New England is the southern extent of this cold water predator's range. Um, and this brings us to an emerging threat. So we, we, there's a lot of work uh, that's been done. We know a lot about how temperature affects cod, and we know a lot about how um, overfishing has affected the cod population. But this is kind of um, a new threat uh, for cod in this area. So black sea bass uh, distribution has changed over the last few decades. Uh, they're originally from the Mid-Atlantic Bight region, um, and they're moving northward as waters have warmed. <coughs> Uh, and based on previous diet analyses for black sea bass, they're expected to be a top competitor with cod in southern New England. Um, and this is just a, a graphic showing uh, from 1968 through 2014 how um, kind of the distribution of black sea bass has changed. So the blue color is few fish, zero. Uh, red is lots of fish. So we can see over time how uh, they've kind of started out down here, and now a lot of their center of biomass has moved northward. Um, and why does this matter? So why do we care about black sea bass, and why do we care about their potential effects on Atlantic cod? Um, so the Atlantic cod population is already at historic lows, like I said. Um, so it's important to try and understand how this new stressor could exacerbate the conditions that they're experiencing. Um, and one way that we're uh, trying to figure that out is looking at how uh, these black sea bass could be competing for resources, uh, particularly, particularly we'll be looking at uh, how much they overlap in diet. Um, so how are we doing this? So we're, to, we're doing kind of a multi-method approach. So we're coupling traditional, traditional gut content analysis, um, like what Maggie talked about with her striped sea robin, uh, with some newer stabilized choke techniques. Um, so for every fish that we catch, we uh, first have to dissect it. So this is uh, me and one of our undergrads dissecting one of our black sea bass. And so for every fish, um, we're collecting a piece of muscle, a piece of liver. Uh, we're doing a gut content analysis. Um, and we're also collecting otoliths. So otoliths are small ear bones um, in the skull of a fish that helps them have a sense of uh, kind of gravity and a sense of uh, acceleration. Um, and these are really cool because 
they're laid down uh, kind of over time like the uh, trunk of a tree, so in rings. So you can use these uh, ear bones to age a fish. Um, so to gut content analysis, uh, like I said, Maggie talked a little bit about this, but we're basically taking everything out of the stomach, counting it up and weighing it, and seeing what's in there uh, on a species level. Um, and it's, like I said, great species level data, and the technique has been used for a really long time. Um, and it gives us a really good snapshot of what has been most recently eaten. Um, and these are some of our results for, of our gut content analysis. So on our x-axis, we have winter cod, summer cod, winter black sea bass, and summer black sea bass. And the y-axis is um, a percentage of how much uh, a certain prey item makes up of that organism's diet. So this blue color is uh, cancer crab, like Jonah or rock crab. Uh, the red is fish. The greenish blue color is shrimp, and yellow is for other invertebrates. Um, and as you can see, uh, winter black sea bass, summer black sea bass, and summer cod are eating a lot of crab. Uh, but there's more variation in the winter cod's diet, so they're eating um, a lot more fish and a lot more shrimp. And like I said, uh, there are a lot of really good reasons that gut content analysis mm -hmm. is um, a good technique. Um, however, the technique does have its challenges. So like I said, it's just a snapshot, so it tells us what's been eaten in the last 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but I'm sure that if I asked any of you what you ate for breakfast today, that's not truly a representative of what you're eating all the time. So uh, it's not a really good picture of what the organism is always eating. Um, additionally, it's really biased uh, towards things that digest more slowly. So a lot of the time you can get a lot of this mush inside of a stomach that uh, Maggie sort of alluded to that you can't really identify. Um, so harder things like shells and the carapaces of crab uh, digest a little more slowly, so it's easier uh, to find those in a stomach content analysis. Um, so that brings us to our stable isotope techniques, which we're um, coupling with gut content analysis to try and um, get more information about the food web uh, than gut content analysis can tell us on its own. So um, how do we use isotopes in our work? So basically, you've all heard of uh, you are what you eat. And using isotopes, that truly is the case. So um, isotopes allow us to have a chemical fingerprint uh, based on diet. Um, and it's a complementary technique to the gut content analysis, like I said. So uh, using this isotope technique, you'll never get species level data like you would with gut content analysis. You will get an integrated signal over, uh, for example, for muscle, you'll get an integrated signal over months, uh, and liver will give you an integrated signal over weeks. So you'll never get that species level data from this type of technique, but you are getting more information about where that, where that organism lies in a, on a food web. Um, but what exactly are isotopes? So isotopes are atoms of the same element that have the same number of protons, and therefore they have the same chemistry, uh, but they have a different number of neutrons and have different mass or weight. So um, for example, these are two um, isotopes of nitrogen, so nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15, uh, where nitrogen-15 is the heavier isotope and has the extra neutron. Um, and this notation here, uh, I'll refer to it as delta 15n. You'll see it quite a bit in my presentation. And all that is referring to is it's the ratio of the heavier to the lighter isotope. So the ratio of, for example, n15 to n14. Um, and the way that we use these isotopes is uh, as their isotope ratio, like I said. So, um, and the reason why they're so powerful is because isotope ratios change in predict predictable ways as organic matter moves through a food web, which can help us to identify patterns of trophic dynamics and tell us where an organism is in a food web. So, and what do I mean by that it can change in predictable ways? So uh, this is an example um, of a food chain and how it would lay in isotope space. So uh, this is delta 13C, which is uh, the ratio of the heavier to lighter isotopes of carbon. Um, and this is, once again, the delta 15N, which is the heavier to lighter uh, ratio of the isotopes of nitrogen. And um, as we move from phytoplankton to zooplankton to a small fish to our cod, uh, we can see that uh, both of our isotopes are getting higher. Um, their ratios are getting higher as we move up in the food web, which is what I mean by moving in predictable ways. So we can use uh, this information to try and understand more about where an organism is in the food web. 
So, uh, like I said, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the results um, that I have so far with my muscle samples. So, for any sample preparation, uh, including muscle, first you would want to freeze dry it. So, uh, we're basically removing all of the moisture from our muscle. Um, and then we would use a mortar and pestle just like this to turn that muscle into powder. Um, and then, uh, for bulk isotope analysis, you take some of that muscle and you put it into a tiny tin capsule, and then you put that tin capsule full of powdered muscle into something called an elemental analyzer. And what that does is it basically drops your sample into a furnace where it heats it up at a very high heat, and it basically turns all of the carbon in your sample into CO2 and all of the nitrogen in your sample into nitrogen gas, um, which then uh, the elemental analyzer can read those ratios of the, lighter, the heavier to the lighter isotopes in. Um, and so this is an example of some of the results that you would get from that kind of bulk isotope analysis. So on, once again, on the x-axis, I have that uh, delta 13C, and on the y is the delta 15N. Um, and uh, the orange color is black sea bass, and the blue color is cod. Um, and here we're looking at just winter, so we have winter and summer, once again, just like the gut content analysis data. So for winter, we're seeing that these uh, two species are kind of overlapping quite a bit in isotope space, which um, makes us, kind of gives us the idea that they're going to overlap in food web ecology as well. And here we have the same sort of plot, but now for summer, um, and the colors are the same and so are the axes, so the <coughs> axis here is once again delta 13C and delta 15N, um, and we're seeing here that there is um, some separation uh, between uh, the cod and black sea bass in summer. But it's kind of really hard to interpret what any of this means, and I'll show you why in a second. So uh, we can imagine that this is once again our bulk isotope data. So this is once again a delta 15N, and this is fish A and fish B, and these are where they're li laying in isotope space. And this difference between fish A and fish B could be because these two fish uh, are at different trophic levels. So like we said, uh, the, tr the um, delta 15 n will change predictably as we move up trophic levels. So it could be that fish B is at a higher trophic level than fish A. Or it could also mean that fish A, the base of that food web that that fish is a part of, has a different baseline value. And with bulk isotope analysis, it's nearly impossible to know uh, what is causing that difference, whether it's due to trophic uh, <coughs> position or something at the base of the food web, something that's being caused by the, a difference in the primary producers. Which brings us to our compound-specific isotope analysis of amino acids. Uh, so bu bulk analysis averages all of the isotope values for all of the compounds present in your sample. So you can think of bulk isotope analysis as uh, kind of chewing up this trail mix and you're getting all those uh, kind of textures and flavors and you can't really pick anything out. It's kind of just an average of everything that's in there. So all of your fatty acids, amino acids, sugars, and glycerol, all in there. Uh, and compound specific analysis, it really allows us to pick out and isolate uh, individual compounds. For example, in our trail mix, maybe we just want the M&M. Uh, in our case, we're going to be looking at just the amino acids. So uh, just some theory behind this technique. So uh, two amino acids of uh, pretty big importance for this kind of technique is phenylalanine, which uh, we're denoting here as C, and glutamic acid, which is uh, glue. So phenylalanine is a source amino acid, which means that this amino acid's uh, isotope signature, so that ratio of the heavier to lighter um, isotope, uh, is set at the base of the food <coughs> web uh, whatever it was when it was created by the primary producer, and it does not change as we move up trophic levels. So from trophic level one, two, three, our phenylalanine value is still the same. Our glutamic acid uh, is called a trophic amino acid, and it moves um, up in ratio <coughs> as we move up trophic levels. So we can use these two particular amino acids to get a lot more information um, about not only the base of the food web, but also the trophic position that our organism is at. Um, and so this is results uh, of our compound-specific isotope analysis of amino acids. So once again, our black sea bass is in orange, the cod is in blue, 
Um, and for uh, our circles, our summer samples, and our winter samples are the squares. And on our x-axis, we just have the glue and feed for glutamic acid and phenylalanine. And then our y-axis is uh, that delta 15N, so that ratio, again, of the heavy to light isotope of nitrogen. Um, and we're seeing here that uh, there is a significant difference in the nitrogen value for uh, glutamic acid between species in winter. Um, and there's also a difference in the phenylalanine value in both species between seasons. Um, and this indicates a change in the production at the base of the food web seasonally. So what I mean by that is that uh, summer cod are different from winter cod and summer black sea bass are different from winter black sea bass. But that summer black sea bass are the same as summer cod and winter black sea bass are the same as winter cod. So uh, we think that this is a change seasonally, not between species. Uh, but, and this phenylalanine value can tell you that much about um, kind of the base of the food web, but on its own, this glutamic acid value doesn't tell you too much. But by comparing these two values, you can calculate the trophic position, uh, which is something that Maggie talked a little bit about before, uh, and this is the same kind of concept. Uh, and basically, what we're seeing here on the x-axis is winter cod, summer cod, winter black sea bass, and summer black sea, uh, summer black sea bass, and on the y, is trophic position, and we're seeing here that uh, winter cod, that first bar, um, are at a, eating at a higher trophic position than summer cod or winter or summer black sea bass. Um, so some con conclusions from all this. Uh, the diet data does suggest that there's evidence of resource competition between the two species for benthic crustaceans, uh, aka crabs. Uh, and isotope data suggests that cod and black sea bass appear to be directly competing for resources during the summer. Uh, and this is important because this is when black sea bass are expected to be most abundant uh, and when cod may be undergoing thermal stress. Thank you. Any questions? They're the, they're the same. They're just okay. from different yeah. seasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, did you find that they were Basically, our because uh, we saw that our um, winter cod were eating something a little bit different and could have been eating at a higher trophic position. So we were seeing. <coughs> yep. Sure. Yep. Um, the I'm not sure what eats sea bass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sea um, robins are eating them. <laughs> I think it's kind of like what Maggie was talking about. Black sea bass reproduce here now, so in the fall we'll catch like tiny, tiny ones in the bay, which may get eaten by all sorts of larger fish predators. Um, but big black sea bass are also kind of like spiky, mm -hmm. so they'd be a bit tougher to suck down. I think. Yeah. So the slide in for petri dishes of the problem with the sea bass. Were, it looked like they were mostly pinfish, but, that, but, the, but the bar graph showed they were 99% crab. Yeah, what, those, what that, that, sorry, yeah, it was 90% crab. That that was just an example. That wasn't my real. Um, okay, I wasn't actually. No, no, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the sea bass and the cod differentiate by habitat at all? Because I know that they both hang on rock piles, but are you seeing a lot of them? Um, I think that uh, I know that um, the black sea bass are more offshore in the winter, um, but I'm not sure about their preferences for habitat other than that. Yeah. Do you know? Wrong. I mean, we did on your cod trips. We probably caught ten sea bass to every cod, and we were targeting cod. So yeah, you know, <laughs> getting through the sea bass was the limit on how many cod we could catch. So you're definitely in safe spots in the summer. So historically, cod have had a huge economic impact on any number of cultures and communities. What about the black sea bass? What's, uh, what's the future for them with respect to economics? I'm not sure. They're, they're a pretty targeted fishery in Point Judith. Mm -hmm. uh, the core 
what is really low right now because the yeah. fishery was managed by um, the Atlantic States Commission. So there's a total quota set by the federal government and that's set, divided up amongst the states. And then each state gets to decide how they want to enforce the regulation. You know, is it you can only catch so many per trip or is it, you know, a total catch, whatever. Um, as of when I was learning about this, say two years ago, um, the issue was is that because sea bass were so historically southern, a lot of the high quota and the high um, catch was reserved for states more southern than Rhode Island. So Rhode Island didn't have a huge share of the quota, whereas like um, New Jersey, Virginia, North Carolina had a lot more because that's historically where the black sea bass have been. Um, so it has the potential to be a big fishery. It's in other places. It's definitely something that the fishermen here will keep if they catch and if they have the permits for. Um, and it's delicious. So you can find it in all the restaurants and um, fish markets. But I think right now there's a little bit of um, quota limitation, which I think people are working on. Yeah. Sea bass have made it to Maine, though, which is making the lobstermen very, very nervous. Oh. They're a voracious predator. Mm -hmm. so. so does that mean they're anywhere on the U.S. coast is Rhode Island Sound. <laughs> we are the epicenter currently. Yeah, play that. So see, like, they started there off, like, the Chesapeake, and then by the end of this, you'll see it's blood red for the south of us. Um, and like I said, they are catching them in Maine now. Um, I have a lobsterman friend up there who gets them in his pots, so. <laughs> They're moving. They, in the winter, they'll go, they kind of bleached out, but you can see that dark red splotch on Rhode Island. They go to the shelf break in the winter, because it's warmer. Um, so do our flukes, so do our squid. A lot of species do that, so they kind of do a seasonal transit of the continental shelf, but they don't go all the way back down to the Chesapeake. They might just go to like Hudson Canyon or something and then come back. Anything else? Well, if you think of anything on your way out, Mac and Nina, I'm sure we'll hang out for a few minutes. Otherwise, we'll thank them again. Uh, we are figuring out our next event. Uh, watch our Facebook page or our email list. If you're not on the email list, we have a sign up outside. Uh, we're trying to navigate speakers around a big conference that half our campus goes to. So we will announce the date soon once we figure them out. Um, otherwise, have a great night and thanks for coming. Thank you.